All right, let's get into the sermon now. Um, please take your Bibles and turn to Genesis 28. Genesis 28. Genesis 28, and look at verse number 17. The Bible says, And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. There is none other but, uh, sorry, this is none other but the house of God. The title for the sermon this morning is The House of God. And this is the beginning of what we identify as the local New Testament church. The, the, the local New Testament church is known as the house of God. And if you are here or you listen to the sermon on Wednesday, I was, go, I was explaining the books of the Bible and how the book of Genesis begins all the core doctrines, all the, all the fundamental doctrines you're aware of, even the New Testament church. We start seeing many of the truths, many of the applications associated with the church just here in Genesis chapter 28. But let's start with verse number 1. Genesis 28, verse 1. The Bible says, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. You may remember the name Laban. Laban was the brother, the older brother of Rebekah. And it seems like her father had passed away. And it seems like from the story that we introduced to Laban and Rebecca that he's taken a prominent position in the family. Kind of like, you know, being, being that, that, you know, taken over the house because the father was not there. Now keep your finger there. Go back to Genesis 24. Genesis 24, please. Just four chapters back. Genesis 24, verse 3. Now this might sound familiar because it's the same instruction that Abraham said to Isaac or to, the, or to his servant to find a wife to, for Isaac. Verse number 3, Genesis 24, 3. It says, And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But thou go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. So just to bring to remembrance, now we're seeing Abraham, we saw there in, Matthew, in Genesis 24, Abraham saying to his servant, to his most loyal servant, uh, uh, to, or to the second command of his house, hey, go back to the place, go back to, uh, where was it, to Badan Aram, and go find a wife for Isaac. And so here in Genesis 28, we're seeing the same process. Isaac, having passed the blessings um, of, the, of, you know, um, of the birthright, the blessings of, of, of the seed, the blessings of, of all nations being blessed for this lineage, being passed down to Jacob. And the same instruction Isaac is telling to Jacob, look, don't take a wife from the Canaanites. And, and, and fathers, mothers, we need to teach our children, you know, don't take a wife or don't take a husband of the unsaved Canaanites of this land. We need to make sure we instruct our children to make sure they go find a, a godly spouse. Somebody that can have a fear of the Lord, someone that is saved. And we see the same concerns. We don't want these Canaanites. They worship false gods. They go, look, and plus, they know, they know the promise that God has given them, that that land will become theirs. They know the promise, you know, there was the curse of Canaan that fell upon Canaan. And we, we see the promises here that, you know, knowing that God's going to destroy these people one day. That one day this land will be taken by the nation of Israel. And they did not want a, a wife from this land and so we see the same thing playing out here go back to genesis 28 verse 3 genesis 28 verse 3 and while you're going back there please also go to hebrews 11 keep your finger there and go to hebrews 11 i want to uh, clarify a couple of things here go to hebrews chapter 11 verse 20 hebrews chapter 11 verse 20 because hebrews 11 of course is known as the the chapter of of of, of, of faith right the, the, the hall of faith, great men that had great faith. And if you recall last week um, that Isaac blessed Jacob, right, with a blessing, but did he mean to bless him? No, he was deceived, wasn't he? He was deceived and he blessed, Isaac, uh, he blessed Jacob instead of Esau. And so one thing as you're reading through the great hall of faith in, in Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse number 20, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 20, the Bible says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember reading Hebrews chapter 11 at some point in my life and going, by my faith, 
Uh, Isaac blessed, well, we know he blessed Esau later on, but he blessed Isaac. I mean, by faith. He was deceived in the previous chapter. Was that really by faith? Did he do it by faith or was he deceived? Well, here, here's the clarification. If you go back to, to Genesis 28, verse 3, Genesis 28, verse 3, have a look at this. What does Isaac say to Jacob? Verse number 3. And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padanaram unto Laban, son of Bethuel the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. So here it is, guys. You know, once again, we see Isaac blessing Jacob with the same blessing, the same promises, the same blessing, but this time he's doing it by faith, all right? In the previous chapter, he did it by deception. But this time now we see, not on, you know, he's not given a new blessing. He's repeating the same blessing, but now he's confirming it. You know, he says, yes, you know, Jacob is the one. Jacob is the one that will be blessed. Jacob is the one by which the promised seed will come through. Uh, his lineage. And so this is the time he does it by faith, right? This is the time he does it by faith. So when you read Hebrews 11 verse 20, I used to get confused by it until I recognized, well, hold on. Yes, he blessed him by deception, but now in the pre next chapter, he confirms it, not deceived, and he blesses him properly. And then we have verse number six in Genesis 28 verse six. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padanaram to take him a wife, a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother, and was gone to Padanaram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael, and took unto the wives which he had, uh, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, Nebojov to be his wife. Now, when it says there in verse number nine, then when Esau unto Ishmael, Ishmael we already saw had passed away. Okay, but what he's saying is he went to Ishmael's family. All right, and he took for a wife one of Ishmael's daughters there. Okay, so why did he do this? And the, the, the thing that I wanted to talk about here is we start to see the effect of favoritism in the family. If you remember, uh, Rebecca favored Jacob um, and and uh, Isaac preferred uh, Esau, okay? But now he sees both parents blessing uh, Jacob, both parents blessing him. And what, what, I, what, what I think we can take out of this lesson, when you start to show favoritism toward a child, you start to give them special privileges, special blessings, you know, you, you think you might be doing a great thing for that child, you think that child needs it or deserves it, but it has an effect on your other children. Your other children are watching that. And what's going to happen? They're going to want to emulate that other child. Instead of being the person that they are, they are. instead of being, you know, uh, someone that feels validated by their family, you know, they, des they, they desire to be like their sibling. And so here we see with Esau, remember, he already had two wives. The previous chapters told us about this. He already took two wives, which were wrong. He took them from the land of Canaan, where he shouldn't have taken a wife. And they were grief, they were a burden to his mother, to his father, to his parents, and he sees Jacob being blessed, he sees the instruction, don't take a wife from Canaan, go, go back to Padanaram, then he goes, oh, wow, Jacob's done that, I better go do something similar, you know, so he goes to the family of Ishmael, which was part of the family, of course, the father of the son of uh, Abraham, and he takes a third wife, all right, now the lesson here is two wrongs don't make a right, okay, he tried to fix things, I, I can see at least with Esau, He's trying to do what's right, right? He's trying, I'm going to take a wife, hopefully this pleases mom and dad. You can see the insecurities he has. You can see that he's trying to emulate his brother. You know, he doesn't feel validated by his family now because both of them, you know, have Jacob as, as well, in his view, as their favorite. So he's observed this and he's trying to emulate that. He's trying to do something. And this is what happens when you show favoritism. The other child might, just, might mean well, they might be trying to do what's right, but they end up doing what's wrong. You know, and, and here Esau is trying to fix the fact that he took two wives, 
He takes a third wife. I mean, he's committing adultery, he's committing polygamy, and just makes things worse. You know, two wrongs do not make right. And so, uh, please be careful, parents, with how you demonstrate love and favoritism, you know, if you do, to a child. It's going to have an effect on your other children. Let's go back to Genesis 28, verse 10. Oh, you guys are there already. Verse 10. The Bible says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. So this is a, this is a you know, several day journey. So he's on his way. He needs to find a place to sleep. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. I mean, I've always wondered about this. How? I mean, I wouldn't use a stone as a pillow. I'm assuming these are like smoothed out stones or something. I, I really don't know. But anyway, he, he lays down to sleep, verse number 12. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder, ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Now, before I keep reading, this is not a vision, or this is not something he's seen with his physical eyes. He's gone to sleep, he's having this dream, and God is showing him this dream. So there's a ladder from the earth all the way to heaven, angels descending and ascending up and down on that ladder. Verse number 13, and behold... The Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. Now just a reminder, of course, the seed, who is the seed? Jesus Christ. Okay? So we saw Isaac bless Jacob with this blessing, and here comes God confirming this, confirming this himself, uh, saying the same thing, that it's coming from God himself. Verse number 14. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. Now you might say, hold on, how can one see Jesus Christ be as the dust of the earth? That's because if you're in Christ, you are Abraham's seed. Everyone that's saved, all generations, you know, over the time period, if you're in Jesus Christ, you make up that seed. And yeah, if you put all the believers together, we'd be as the dust of the earth or the sand of the sea. And it says, he keeps going, and in thee, verse number 14, and in thee, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. What was that blessing? Salvation, Jesus Christ, the gospel, right? Verse number 15, and behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep. And he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? There is none other, this is none other, but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. I mean, the, the next verses are so much in these verses. I mean, I, I can just think about several sermons that I could preach on the fo following verses. Now, I, I don't know how much, you know, Jacob is speaking um, you know, by the Spirit of God. You know, I don't know how much he's speaking kind of out of ignorance or just out of the fear of God that he has, but so much of what he says now applies to the church. Okay, so much of what he says. Let's look at verse number 17 again. It says, And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? And I mentioned how the house of God is also the name given to the New Testament church. You know, when you come to church, it ought not to be a casual thing. It ought not to be something that, you know, just monotonous part of your life that you don't really care about. When you come to God, you ought to say, how dreadful is this place? And of course, by dread, it's talking about fear. It's not talking about something bad. It's something, a, a fearful place. It says he was afraid. When you come to church, you ought to have, you know, a fear of God. And let me tell you, brethren, when I get up to preach, I have a fear of God. I don't want to preach the wrong thing. You know, I don't want to mislead you. I have a fear of the people of God even. You know, to make sure that I teach what's right. Because I don't want the chastisement of God. I don't want God to be ashamed of me. I don't want God to say, well, you've not studied. You don't know the scriptures. You know, I have a fear of God just to preach. We ought to have a healthy fear of God when we come to this place. Why was he afraid? Look at verse number 16. And, ja and Jacob awake out of his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place. Hey, that's why we ought to have a fear of God when we come to church. Because the Lord is in this place. Praise God for His promises. You come to church, you come to His house, the Lord is here. And He says, and I knew it not. 
You know, and that's what we need to realize. Sometimes you might come to church, you know, that monotonous part of your life. No fear, just casual. At that point, you knew or not, you forgot that the Lord is here. The Lord wants to work with you. The Lord wants to, you know, uh, wants you to learn from the preaching. The Lord wants you to fellowship and serve one another. The Lord wants you to learn from the hymns. The Lord wants you to lift up your hearts and your voices to worship Him. And we need to remember how important the local church is. And, uh, but the church is not the only place that's known as the house of God. So I want to look at this title, the house of God. Please keep your finger there in Genesis 28 and go to Exodus 34. Let's have a look at the several places in the Bible that are known as the house of God. And these things develop over time. These things develop over time. And they basically take over the previous thing. Okay, we saw here where Jacob is at. He, re- he identifies this as the house of God because this is where God is, right? And if we go to Exodus 34, verse 26. Exodus 34, verse 26. So God is passing down the law to Moses and explaining how things need to operate in this new nation of Israel. And uh, God, he instructs uh, Moses how to build the tabernacle. So if you recall, before the temple, God instructed them to uh, to build a tabernacle. It was basically like a temple, but it was something they could carry with them. It was basically covered by a tent. They could pack up, carry it with them as they journeyed in the wilderness, you know, carry it with them as they went to the land of Canaan. And it says here in verse number 26, Exodus 34, 26, The first of the firstfruits of thy land thou shalt bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not seethe a kid in his mother's milk. So you can see here the tabernacle that they're required to give to, to do sacrifices in, is known as the house of the Lord thy God. Now go to Exodus 25, please, just a few chapters back. Exodus 25, look at verse number 8. Exodus 25, verse 8. The Bible says, And let them make me a sanctuary, that's the tabernacle, look at this, that I may dwell among them. So that's something you'll notice about the house of God, right? Is that it is, it is a place known as His house, But the purpose for it is that he will be amongst us. You know, his presence will be there. And of course, his presence was there in that tabernacle. Now, please go to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. Now we're going to look at the temple. We're fast forwarding several several centuries later. And um, King David wanted to build a temple for the Lord. He wasn't satisfied with the tabernacle. He thought the Lord deserved something a little bit more solid, a little bit more permanent. Uh, but uh, the Lord did not allow King David to build it, but he allowed his son Solomon to build it. So we're going to 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10. Of course, this is speaking about the temple once it was completed. And it says here, And it came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. So you can see the temple being called the house of the Lord. Verse 11. So that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the lord had filled the house of the lord so you can see again when the temple is built the lord comes with the fullness of his glory there's a cloud they can't even serve they can't even minister it's too much for them the glory of the lord appeared there in this new resurrected uh, uh, completed temple that they had set up but you can see it's known as the house of the lord and the lord's presence is there once again his glory was there Just a reminder, remember, these are the house of the Lord. The things we learn from these previous places is applicable to the New Testament church. You know, our church ought to be filled with the glory of God, okay? With the glory of God. This is why we sing Him the praises, because of His glory. He's deserving of our worship. Now, please go to Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1. Because the first temple got destroyed during the Babylonian captivity, the entire city of Jerusalem destroyed, including the temple. And then after the 70 years of captivity in Babylon, uh, they, you know, the Jews went back and they started to rebuild the city. They re- and they built a new temple. Okay, it's the Rubel's temple, the se- second temple. And it's the second temple by which Jesus Christ, when he came on the earth, that's the temple that he would refer to. It wasn't Solomon's temple. It was the second temple that was built. And in Ezra chapter 1, verse 5, Ezra chapter 1, 
verse 5, the Bible says, Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests, and the Levites, with all them whose spirit God raised, to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Which is in Jerusalem, the house of the Lord. So if there's any doubts, you might wonder, was that second temple really you know, just as valuable or as, as important to God as the first temple? Yes, it is. We see here the Bible, uh, you know, we have the Holy Ghost as our narrator, and the Holy Ghost calls it the house of the Lord, okay? But what we don't have recorded with the second temple is the glory of God or the cloud of God filling that temple. Now, I'm not saying it never happened. I'm not, I'm not really sure. It's just not recorded for us in the Bible. Nevertheless, I'll just read to you from Matthew 21, verse 13. Jesus Christ goes into the temple, right? Jesus Christ goes into the second temple. And he says here, and he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. What does Jesus call the house of God? He calls it my house. And where was Jesus Christ? In the temple, in the house of God. So even though we don't have the glory of God filling that temple, the presence of God recorded for us, we still see when Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, was work, walking the earth. Where was he? In the house of God. His presence was there as well. And he taught. He taught from the temple. He spent, you know, spent many times there, especially during the Passover, he would go there and teach the people. So what I want you to notice, the tabernacle, well, we have uh, uh, you know, J- um, uh, Jacob identifying where he was as the house of God. But then it gets overtaken by the tabernacle. We no longer have that reference as the house of God. We have the tabernacle known as the house of God. Then that place gets replaced by the first temple known as the house of God. That gets destroyed. Then we have the second temple, which is known as the house of the Lord again. Okay? What happens in 70 AD? That temple is destroyed. Okay? So where's the house of God now? I've already been talking about it. It's right here. You know, in this body, the body of Christ, the local New Testament church. If you guys can go to Matthew 18, that'd be great. Matthew 18, verse 20. Matthew 18. Go to Matthew 18. And I'll read to you from 1 Timothy 3, 15. 1 Timothy 3, 15. You guys go to Matthew 18. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3, 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, I'm going to read that verse later on again. But I just want you to notice, it says, In the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Right now, you're in the house of God. What a privilege that we can come every week. We have free service every week. You have the privilege of being in the house of God. Now, if you go to Matthew 18, verse 20, where I ask you to turn. Matthew 18, verse 20. What does Jesus say? He says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. What a promise by God. What a promise by Jesus Christ. That when we're gathered in his name, we're gathered here in this church, he said he's going to be in the midst of us. The Lord's presence is here this morning. Whether you feel it or not, he's here. He wants to work in you. He wants you to learn and grow know the Bible more, grow as a Christian, be more Christ-like. You know, when you come to church, you ought to be asking the Lord, please, Lord, I'm going to meet you. I'm going to be with you. Not Pastor Kevin, right? I'm going to be with you. The word of the Lord is going to be preached. I want to meet you, Lord. I want to, I want to see you. Please show yourself to me. Please show me where I can fix things in my life. Please show me how I can grow and mature in the Lord. Don't take, you know, for advantage the presence of God. Jesus promises us he's going to be here, promises us that. And um, you might say, well, does that mean if we gather two or three, you know, me and my mates, me and my family, the Lord's in the midst of them. Look at verse number 17, just backtrack a little bit. Some people take that, you know, they start their home churches and say, well, we don't need the local church. We can just meet up with friends. And the Lord says he's going to be in the midst of us, right? Two or three gathered together. But the context, Matthew 18, verse 17, of course, was church discipline here that leads up to that. And it says, yeah, and if he shall neglect to hear them, Tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and an publican. So you can see the context of the two or three gathered together is the church. All right? If you just read it within the context, it's not just me and my mates hanging out and having a Bible study. Okay? It's in context of the church. 
So appreciate what you have here on the Sunshine Coast, you know, New Life Baptist Church. It's the house of God. So the next thing that I, w- I want you to cover for you just quickly, well, actually stay there in Matthew 18. Stay there in Matthew 18. But um, uh, Jacob also called it the gate of heaven, didn't he? Right? What did he say? Then let me ha- have a quick look for it again. Matthew 28. What verse was that? 17. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. What an amazing thing. This is the gate of heaven. Have you ever considered your local church to be the gate of heaven? That's what Jacob says. I don't know. Again, I don't know how ignorant he is, but there's so much truth to this, you know. And, but here's where it gets abused. You have the Catholic church, right? They have the Catholic church that say, basically, the only way you can be saved is being part of the Roman Catholic church. Because we're the gate of heaven, is what they'll say. But it's, it's not, of course, that's not what's being said. You know, go, you know, being saved has nothing to do with your church attendance. But if you guys, are, you guys are in Matthew 18, verse 18, Matthew 18, verse 18, we just read the bit where we talked about, you know, if there's a dispute within the church, how to handle things. You know, things will eventually, if they don't, aren't dealt with, need to be brought to the church. And the church is meant to uh, uh, decide on that matter. But look at verse number 18. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What's the context of that? Well, just what you read, church discipline, right? You know, dealing with conflicts in a church. If they can't be rectified and the church has to step in, the Bible's saying here, whatever the church decides will be decided in heaven. You know, and this is the power that God gives us. You know, that, that basically what this church body decides to do, God ticks it off. As long as we are following the principles, the teachings of God, we're doing things according to His will, whatever we decide to do, even if it's church discipline, God says, yes, what you decide to do, what you loose on the earth will be loosed in heaven, what you bind on the earth will be bound in heaven. You know, this is why it's the gate of heaven. This is where you come and, and learn how God feels about things, how God thinks about things. And our decisions that we make as a church need to be made with prayer, with a lot of deep thought, because what we decide will be decided in heaven as well. Okay, The gates of heaven. Go to Matthew 16 now. Matthew 16, verse 18. Matthew 16, verse 18. This isn't the only time that Jesus says what the church does or, or the authority we have to bind and, on, and loose on earth will also be done in heaven. Matthew 16, verse 18. Matthew 16, verse 18. And I say unto thee, speaking to Peter, thou, uh, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and of course that rock is Jesus Christ, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we're talking about the gate of heaven, all right, and the gates of hell here. And some people have misinterpreted this to say the gates of hell are the forces of the devil. I don't believe that because the devil has no authority in hell. It's just that the local church is made up of saved believers and we don't have to have any fear of hell. You know, the fear, there, sh- there should be no concern of us ever going to hell. We shouldn't, you know, the gates of hell should not have any uh, concern in us because we're saved. We're going to heaven. But look at verse number 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so we see that uh, Christ has given us, His church, remember the previous verse, the keys of heaven. And, and here, you know, I believe, what are the keys of heaven? How does someone enter heaven? It's the gospel, right? It's salvation. You know, God has given that to the church. It says, look, I'm giving you the key to heaven. You know, and, and how, how horrible is it when you have, you know, churches, you know, that, that are right in the gospel, but they're not doing any gospel preaching. They're not knocking the doors. They're not soul winning. They've been given the keys, but they're not unlocking the door. They're not unlocking the gate. They're not leading anybody to salvation. That's a sad thing when God has given that to us, the house of God, these keys. And, you know, what I take out of that is basically, you know, we have, it's hard to say, but it's the truth. You know, we have the power to see people saved or unsaved. You know, if, if you don't go and, and, and preach the gospel, you don't give people the gospel, you're withholding them from going to heaven. You go out and you preach the gospel, 
you are opening that door to heaven. You know, it's not like there's no middle ground on this. You know, if you're not giving the gospel, you're closing the door on people. Now, let me show you this. Go to Luke 11. Go to Luke 11, verse 52. I know we're going to a lot of verses, but go to Luke 11, verse 52. I don't want anyone in this church to be like these people that we're about to read, okay? Luke 11, verse 52. This is a time when Jesus Christ is just ripping face against all the the religious leaders, but this time he goes to the lawyers, and the lawyers, you know, people that know the law, the law of God, right? Lawyers. Uh, Luke 11, verse 52, it says, Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. Ye hindered. I don't want us to be like this. You know, now, first of all, these lawyers aren't in, entering heaven themselves anyway. But those that are striving to enter in, those that want to know, and I know how unreceptive this place is, but you know, there's someone right now in, ha- in, in their house wanting to know how to get to heaven. We just need to find them. We just need to keep knocking those doors until we find them. We might find them today, okay? But we just need to keep going. And, and, and someone's wanting to know, but if we don't do it, you know, we're, we're, we're hiding the key from them. We're hiding the entrance from them. I don't want to be like that as a church. We need to get out there, preach the gospel to the lost. <clears throat> You know, the Lord has given us His Word. He's given us all six six books of the Bible. We've got all the ammunition ammunition we need. We've got it all. You know, some of those soul winners before us did not have the completed Bible in their hands. You know, the the, the disciples of old, they only had whatever they had, a few scriptures here and there. People would have to come to the the synagogue to hear the, the Bible read and preached. You've got it in your hands. You probably have several copies in your house. We've got how many copies here, you know, of the Bible? You know, we, we've, got no, we, we've got so many keys that God has given us, so many privileges. We need to make sure we open the gates of heaven to those that are seeking to enter in. Back to Genesis 28, please. Genesis 28. If we can just backtrack to verse 12 for a minute. Verse 12, and I want to give you some thoughts on this. Um, Genesis 28, verse 12. And it says here, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it uh, reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Now, keep your finger there and go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Now, I'm going to give you my thoughts on this. I'm not going to be completely dogmatic. If you disagree with me, you disagree with me. But I believe this ladder, now remember, it's a dream, okay? So it's not something you've seen physically with his eyes. It's a dream. But I believe this ladder is symbolic or represents Jesus Christ. Okay, it's a ladder f- from earth going all the way to heaven. And the angels are de- ascending and descending on it. I believe this is Jesus Christ. Because it's only Jesus Christ that can link us to heaven. It's only through him that we can make it there. Okay? And if you look at John chapter 1 verse 51. John chapter 1 verse 51. This is after he meets Nathaniel under the tree. John chapter 1 verse 51. This is Jesus, what he says to him. And he saith unto him... Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So we see, now, you know, that that verse has always made me scratch my head a little bit, ascending and descending. Now, we do see several instances where the angels come and and minister to Christ. You know, after the temptation in the wilderness, we see the angels come to minister to him. When we see Christ praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion, we see an angel come to comfort him and to strengthen him. Uh, what other times do we have angels associated with Christ? Um, at his resurrection. Uh, so when the people come to the tomb to see the body of Christ and the stones rolled away, you know, the ladies are met by some angels there. Um, also, the ascension of Christ as he ascends up to heaven in the cloud, the angels come and say, hey, what are you looking at? <laughs> right? The angels are there as well. Uh, so maybe that's a reference to that to Nathaniel. Maybe yeah, you know, they, they physically saw these angels But I just believe what's being referred to here is that Jesus is referring to himself as that ladder, pointing back to what Jacob said, pointing back to that ladder where the angels are ascending and descending. And maybe Nathaniel, maybe he just finished reading that recently, and he's been, oh, you're the ladder, you're the way to heaven, (laughs) right? I think that's what's going on here. But that's, I'm not going to be totally dogmatic on that. Uh, You might have some different views. But go back to uh, Genesis 28, please. Genesis 28, verse 18. 
Genesis 28, verse 18. <clears throat> it says, And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. Again, how much does Jacob know what he's doing? Did God instruct him to do this? No. But he's doing something. He takes those stones that he slept, he had that vision, puts it up as a pillar, you know, like a memorial, you know, something like a monument, and he anoints it with oil. He pours oil upon the top of it. Now, please go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read once again from 1 Timothy 3.15. already read it, but just a reminder. It says here, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, right, which is the church of the living God, but what is the New Testament called here? The pillar and ground of the truth. You know, how amazing is that, right? Jacob, I don't know how much he knows, but he sets it up as a pillar. This is the house of God. And the New Testament church is known as the pillar and ground of the truth. And so I think, you know, God is just honoring what Jacob did. And he takes those principles and applies it to his house. You know, there were pillars set up in the temple, for example, as well, uh, which was the house of God. And here in John chapter 1, so not only does he set up the pillar, uh, sorry, first, sorry, um, first John chapter 2, I asked you to go to, first John chapter 2, not only does he set up the pillar, but then he anoints it with oil, okay, he anoints it with oil, and this is what I believe is going on here, let's have a look at first John chapter 2 verse 27, we've also been anointed, the Bible says here, first John chapter 2 verse 27, but the anointing which ye have received of him, abideth in you and ye need not that any man teach you but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie and even as it have taught you ye shall abide in him what's that anointing that you have that teaches you all things we know it's the holy spirit you know it's the holy spirit of god and that's the anointing and so we have this pillar that jacob sets up he anoints it with oil and what do we get? How can we, uh, you know, relate that to the local church? Well, that our church ought to be a pillar of the truth. All right, the ground of truth. It's where you come to hear the truth preached. All right, you're not going to hear the truth preached in the media. You're not going to hear the truth preached in your magazines. All right, on, on, on radio. This is the ground of truth. This is the pillar. But that pillar was anointed with oil, and I believe what's been represented here is that the church of God needs to be made up of saved people. People that are believers. People that have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. That's what the church is for. But what are the churches doing these days? Well, no, no, the church is for the world. Let's open the floodgates. Let's let everybody in. That's not how it is. Church is not for the unbeliever. No, church are for those that are anointed with the Holy Spirit. That's what church ought to be, okay? I would rather a small church made up of believers than a church of a thousand people where most are not even saved, don't even know the gospel, all right? I mean, that's what it is, right? The pillar and the ground of truth. And Jacob does, he anoints it with oil for whatever reason. Well, I know, I know the reason now, all right? Because it's made up of anointed people that have the Holy Ghost living in them. Back to Genesis 28, Verse 19, Genesis 28, verse 19. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God be with me and will keep me in, in, uh, keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. It's interesting what he says here, you know, if the Lord be with me, now the Lord just finished saying to him, yeah, you know, I'm going to be with you. He just finished saying that, right? I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bring you back to the land. I'm going to bless you, all these kinds of things. And he says, you know, if, if God does that for me, and not only that, but gives me bread and to eat and raiment to put on, if, if God can just provide my food and my clothing, is what he says. And again, so profound what he says. So profound. I don't know if you realize, because the Bible says, in uh, 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, and having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. 
all right, having food and raiment. God wants us to be content, full of joy, happy, enjoying life, being satisfied, if all we have is food and raiment. But our society teaches us that's not enough to make you content. Our society teaches us you've got to have the house, you've got to have the car, you've got to get the, the internet connection, the whatever, the Netflix, the Fox, Foxtel, I don't know, whatever other you know, subscription services there are. You know, fill your life with merchandise and fill your life with all these kinds, you know, with riches. You know, go on holidays, you know, go all over the world. And there's nothing wrong with some of these things. But, you know, that's not what ought to drive you to be content. I mean, if you're seeking possessions, material wealth to make you happy, it's not going to happen. Once you have it, you're going to want more. You know, God says be content with just the food and the raiment. And if you can tell me today you've eaten, you know, you've got clothes, then guess what? God's provided for you. Be happy. Be content. He says, look, if God's able to do that, and uh, and verse 21 I think is kind of relevant, so that I come against my father's house in peace. He's talking about, of of course, Isaac coming back because he's on his journey. But, you know, we got the father's house to be finished. Well, he's our father here in heaven, and father, the house of God. You know, we ought to be, you know, can you, have you come to church today in peace? Were you persecuted on your way here? <laughs> you know, were you arrested and thrown into jail today, this morning? No, you've come to the Father's house in peace. He says, look, if God's able to do all these things, you know, and, and then shall the Lord be my God. Is, is the Lord God of, of Jacob your God? Is the God of Abraham your God? You know, and before I keep going, I'll just read to you from Matthew 6.31. Matthew 6.31, I'll just, you don't need to turn there. Jesus says, take, uh, therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or whither, or whither withal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. What things? Eating and what you wear. Verse number 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You see, if you put God first, you put his laws, his ways, you do things according to God's word, he's going to make sure you at least have the food and the raiment. At the very least. And all of you, I'm sure, will say, well, we've got more than that. Well, praise God. You've been blessed. Your cup's overflowing then. Be content with the food and the raiment. Jesus says, that's enough. That's enough. But look, Jacob says, look, if you're able to do that for me, God, and then look at verse number 22 in Genesis 28, 22. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. So you come to God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Jacob says, God, if you take care of me, you're my God, I'm saved. I come to the house of God. You give me food and raiment. You give me peace. Then I'm going to tithe, he says. If you're able to do all those things, that's when you tithe. Okay, you give a tenth unto thee. Again, I don't understand. I I don't fully, can't wrap my head around all this. You know, did did, uh, Jacob continue? We don't have this recorded, you know. Did he continually come to the same place every time he was increased with goods? Did he always come back and give a tent to it? Sounds like it. This is a vow that he's making to God. Every time he would come to this pillar, come to the house of God, you know, all that he was able to, to, we see later on, he becomes a very rich man, full of possessions, full of things, that he would come here and give a tenth. He would give his tithe. That's what a tithe means, a tenth, to the house of God. And so I believe in tithing. You know, I believe it's a very important thing that needs to be done in the house of God. And we see the principles here very quickly in the book of Genesis. You say, when should I tithe? When you come to the house of God, when should I tithe? When you're saved, when should I tithe? When you have food and raiment? Oh, but I've got to pay for other things. Food and raiment. That's what you should be content with. If you have those things, then you should be tithing to the house of God, and it's you know it's one of these things that's difficult for a pastor to preach. Honestly, I don't like really talking about it much, because you don't want to you know. There's always someone critical in church. There's always there's always someone that's oh he's preaching it because he wants more money, you know the pastor wants wants money and, and so you know he wants more and more. No, this isn't about the pastor. This is about the house of God. Okay, and the house of God is known as the body of Christ. When you come and you bring your tithe to the body of Christ. You're not tithing to the pastor. You're tithing to Jesus Christ. You're tithing to the house of the Lord. Now, I'm going to preach on tithing uh, soon, coming up in a few weeks, you know, with the Rightly Dividing series. 
but uh, I don't want to steal all my thunder from that. But let's go to, let's go back a few verses now. Go to Genesis 14, a few chapters, sorry. Genesis 14, verse 18. This is the second time the tithe is mentioned in the book of Genesis, the 10th. Genesis 14, verse 18. You may remember this story with Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Genesis 14, verse 18. The Bible says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him, that's blessed Abraham, and said, or Abram at the time, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which have delivered thine enemies into thine hands. And he gave him tithes of all. Okay? So, should the tithe go to the house of the Lord? Yes. But it's also to be given, once it gives to the house, to those that are serving, those that are ministering in the house of the Lord, those that are serving in the house of the Lord. And I'm going to quickly read to you, you don't need to turn, I'm going to read to you from Numbers 18, verse 20. The Bible says, and this is of course with the tabernacle, and the Lord spake unto Aaron, remember Aaron was the first high priest of Israel, thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. Now before I read verse 21, Jesus, God says look to Aaron, look, I am your inheritance. In other words, I'll take care, I'll take care of your needs. Because verse 21 explains this inheritance. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth of Israel for an inheritance, for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. So should the tithe, should the tenth that's given to the house of God be given to the ministers of the house of God? Absolutely. That's God's business. That's what God instructs the ministers uh, should receive. That's what they should be earning, you know. Uh, serving the church, being, being a pastor, or back in these days, the priests, it was right for them to take the tenth that is given to the house of the Lord for the service that they do. So that's the end of that chapter, guys, uh, Genesis 28. I hope you've learned some truths there. It's just amazing, all these things that Jacob does, how it's still applicable for us today. And remember, these things of the house of the Lord are done, you know, centuries before the Old Testament is in effect. All right, now, I know this is an Old Testament book, but the covenant that God gives to Moses at Mount Sinai, man, it's several hundred of, hundreds of years before that happens. You know, the people that say, well, tithing was done away with. Well, it was before the covenant. It was before, you know. And uh, we see the house of the Lord, the New Testament church, you know, also being a place then that we should bring our tithes and our, and our offerings as well. So, you know, I hope this, this chapter gives you a great appreciation for your church. I hope you're reminded when you come here, have a fear of God, God's presence is here, you know, and be seeking for the Lord to work in your hearts as well. Let's pray.